So today we're going to talk about fish diseases. Let me hold this camera a little better. There we go. So here we have two fish with two different issues. Luckily, these are the only sick fish that I have in my entire fish room at the moment. This koi female has what we theorize to be fish acne. So as you can see a little closer, there is a bump under her mouth. And I finally got it under control. It used to be a lot bigger and inflamed. If I keep her in water with higher salinity and Indian almond leaves. Now, I didn't put Indian almond leaves in yet because I wanted to make her a little more visible for the sake of this video because I just did a water change on both of these jars. And I put them in here temporarily so we can film them a little better, so we can see them a little better. But her issue, I think I can have under control. So you can have these weird diseases pop up in your fish. Sometimes you can get them under control. In this case, you know, she can continue to live her life and you can't really see her, but she's a lovely koi. She's 14 months old and she's one of my only koi that is holding uh, the koi pattern really, really well. This guy, on the other hand, who was just resting because he's tired, he was busy flaring at this girl earlier and he finally settled down, which is good because we can film him a little better. If you can look at his face, see how close I can get with the camera still being able to focus. There we go. He has a really weird, mysterious skin condition. Let's see if I can zoom in. This is what it looks like, guys. And as you can see, it's not that great. It could be a variety of things. I've tried a variety of medications and nothing seems to be working. So, and, and he seems really healthy. Besides the fact that he's resting right now, I can include a clip later on of him flaring. He's the healthiest looking guy. He is also 12 months old, not 12 months, 14, sorry, 14 months old. And uh, it makes me really sad, but at this point, um, I can't, I've reached a limit of what I can do to diagnose him. So I'm going to be sending him off to Dr. Eric Johnson, who is a fish veterinarian. And he is going to do a full diagnosis to check for certain diseases. One skin issue that I'm currently worried about is, um, I forgot the name, but it's something that actually can be transmitted to humans and can make humans sick, which is why I think it's very important to figure out what this is, because I do sell fish and I need to be able to figure this out before I start selling again to make sure that I can treat and be 100% sure that I'm sending off healthy fish to everyone else. Oh, he's going to come say hi. So. As part of the diagnosis, I'm going to be sending him off to Dr. Eric Johnson, and unfortunately he will euthanize him and then do a full uh, diagnosis where he's going to pretty much take him apart, run a bunch of tests, look at his internal organs, and do um, scrapes, and he'll look under the microscope. So you can see I'm kind of showing off again after he rested. He's a really beautiful boy, and I'm really sad that this gorgeous guy will unfortunately have to die for the sake of, I guess, science and figuring out what's going on, but you sometimes have to make hard decisions like this, especially if you have a fish room and if you have a disease that's been resistant to a bunch of medications. For the safety of everyone else, as well as the safety of myself, I need to figure out what this is and um, if there's a course of treatment, is this contagious or not, is this dangerous or not, um, I need to know what this is. So. Unfortunately, this guy will not be around much longer. I am actually shipping him tomorrow <sighs> to Dr. Eric, and I wanted to show you guys how beautiful and, and sweet this guy is, just so we can kind of celebrate him and enjoy him while he's still here with us. And hopefully, when I get the results, I will share this with you, and we can learn a bit more from this. As, you know, disease prevention in the fish room, especially in breeding, treating diseases, diagno diagnosing diseases is very, very important when you have a fish room, especially when you're shipping fish to other people. You can't take risks with pe other people's fish getting sick. Other people can get sick. You have to take precautions. And sometimes if that means sacrificing your fish, then, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So I'm sitting here watching my little Lampralagus Ocelotus Gold eating. This is their new tank. Um, it's not really a permanent setup. I'm not sure if I want to change it. But that's kind of what they have going on so far. There's five of them. They have a 20 gallon long all to themselves because 
They're really angry fish. The grumpiest little fish in the world. And they're eating some food right now. But I gotta film this one day. But these guys are the only little fish that I have that will literally attack my hand when I put it in the tank. That's how angry they are. There's one hanging out over here. That one's missing like an entire chunk of a spin because they're so crazy. This is the most magical brine shrimp hatchery ever. And uh, Amber from Big City Betas discovered this and sent this to me. Now, it looks kind of dirty. This is just uh, salt residue from using this. I probably should scrub it, but it's just salt, so it's okay. How this works is this kind of has this labyrinth pattern. And then you put this on top here. So you fill it up with water. And you have this little... Um, little strainer up over here you fill it up to like about here and the brine shrimp they, you put the eggs all around and then the brine shrimp have to swim down here and under and then over and then under and then over until they finally gather here how do they gather here well you cover it so there's only light here and brine shrimp always go towards the light so through this labyrinth you get this perfect separation of baby brine shrimp from eggs because a lot of times when you use a brine shrimp hatchery even when you set it aside to let the brine shrimp eggs float up and then the uh, brine shrimp to go down oftentimes you'll get a lot of eggs still and if baby bettas eat eggs that will help in creating swim bladder issues so this magical thing not only does it not require uh, air bubbles or anything fancy you just you know keep it in warm temperature especially warm temperature room and this will work on its own it actually hatches brine shrimp if you keep your fish room at like around 80 like I do uh, if you set it up um, the night before overnight you'll the next morning you'll have eggs already 12 hours so this is the most magical thing in the world and it's amazing and right now I'm just gonna set up the salt solution so I'm gonna fill up this container with water I'm going to add some uh, kosher salt kosher salt it doesn't have any ooh, oh my gosh I almost dropped it any additives as you can see it is just the salt so I put a tablespoon of this fill it up with water uh, I'll take this to my fish room because I don't want to carry this with the eggs because I don't want them to move anywhere I'm going to set this down pour the water in sprinkle brine shrimp eggs all around and cover it up so i'll show you once i get that ready okay let's set this up by the way i forgot to mention that i add baking soda in here to kind of buffer the water so actually i'll take this off first so i like to pour the water in right here and pour it enough so it's a little bit over every black part. So this means that the brain shrimp can go over. There we go, now it's nice and nice and level. So the brain shrimp can swim over, but at least you can see they can't go over the white barrier part. So we've got some brain shrimp eggs, which I also got from Amber. Actually, Amber sends the best care packages. She is the better fairy godmother. But um, you measure this out. Now this is not really great for a high yield in my opinion. Um, so if you have a, a ton of spawns um, for, some, for, for some whatever reason, I don't think this will work very well. I think for me it works for like one scoop like this. Any more is going to be you just tap some off it's not going to work very well so if you have a high yield the whole old school way of using the bubbles and air stone and a water bottle will work better but if you're like me and only have like one spawn and then one tiny one 
I have enough to go around for those two, including to feed my Epistogramma babies as well. But this can also be great as an extra hatchery, just in case if you're running another one. Because this one requires really no maintenance. So here is what the brine shrimp hatchery looks like the very next day. And as you can see, all the little... Oh, it does not want to focus. All the little brine shrimps are collecting right here. And if I grab this, the cool thing about it is it'll sift out the water. So all the water will kind of drip down. And look! Look at all the brine shrimps. Now I can use this to feed my fry. Here's a little fry tank. I'm going to give these guys some brine shrimp. And then I'm going to give some brine shrimp to the um, Epistogramma fry and as well the guppies are going to eat some too. These guys are going to get quite a bit. I'm actually going to give them some more back here. These guys are already eating as well. Live foods are really, really great to feed a little fry. They are highly nutritious because they are very freshly hatched. They also definitely encourage the red coloration to show up in certain fish that are red. Let's take a closer look at these guys eating. And you'll be able to see the little orange bellies that these little guys develop as they're eating. Let me see if I can get a little closer. Look how cute these guys are. Eating their little baby brine shrimps. 